अरे गाय माँ Kalam, the Sri Lankan army has been claiming that this kid, the 12-year-old kid, the son of Prabhakaram, he was killed in the crossfire along with many other soldiers. How would your documentary counter that claim? Uh, I'm, we know now for certain that that is not true. Um, the photograph very clearly shows <coughs> that he was, kill, he was uh, held in a calm and controlled situation in a bunker, that he was given biscuits uh, or a snack of some kind, that he was given some uh, some some drink um, we know that on the same camera two hours later he was shown dead again in a calm situation uh, there are soldiers standing around um, the nature of the of the shots uh, clearly one shot and we've had this extensively analyzed by a forensic pathologist uh, from the video evidence <coughs> the first shot which was shot at a range of two to three yards uh, two to three feet he then fell back and from the angle of the uh, bullet entry wounds you can see that he was then shot four more times on the ground um, this was not crossfire this was a cold calculated and deliberate killing uh, tell us something about the making of no fire zone how did you access all this footage were you embedded with the army or how did you you know manage it um, well the, the footage has emerged I mean the point was that this was supposed to be a, a war without witness that in the <clears throat> build-up to the final uh, um, assault, um, the, uh, uh, the UN were forced out of the region by being told that the government could no longer protect them. International media were excluded, and Sri Lankan media were, um, uh, were extensively silenced. I mean, they were silenced by threats, by intimidation. We saw the murder of the editor of the Sunday Leader in the first week of the final onslaught. Um, so um, there was not supposed to be anybody there. The point is that there were people there. The point is that the, the, the events were filmed, uh, not by us, the events were filmed by the people taking part. They were filmed by the victims, by civilians on, on ca cameras, by tiger cameramen who, who had presumably once upon a time thought they would be filming the heroic exploits uh, of, uh, of their own army, but in fact ended up filming the terrible uh, uh, massacres of, of uh, Tamil civilians. Um, and of course, finally, they were filmed by Sri Lankan soldiers themselves um, as trophy videos, as, as souvenirs, as grotesque souvenirs of the war. And some of the most significant photographs of the war crimes committed in the last few days uh, come from those. And they have just been emerging over the past three or four years. I think an interesting thing, actually, just to, uh, while I'm on the subject, is that uh, the Sri Lankan government, they do things like say, oh, didn't they, I mean, interestingly, on Balakandran, they claim simultaneously, uh, and they have claimed that he was killed in crossfire, or that, uh, as the Sri Lankan ambassador to, to India claimed yesterday, they were morphed or faked, um, or that um, it was some kind of rogue elements, um, uh, it, 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 rogue militia. Now, um, they're all contradictory. Um, it, it, we can demonstrate that it wasn't... Um, in, in, in a battle because you can tell that from the nature of the wounds and from the circumstances of the photographs and the fact that there is lots of photographs uh, which you can correlate and cross-reference. We know that um, it wasn't, uh, if it was a militia, um, and actually interestingly enough the Sri Lankan government have stopped saying that now, which is hardly surprising because if it was a rogue militia, what were they doing accompanying Sri Lankan troops on the front line? And I think that poses more questions for the Sri Lankan government than it, than it answers. Um, uh, and in terms of whether the footage was faked, it wasn't. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, th th this, this did happen. Sri Lankan government has always been claiming that the footage is even fake. You know, uh, how would one, you know, uh, counter that claim? Do we have forensic experts, you know, actually countering that? Yes, we've had, you I mean, know, to take this particular Balachandran, uh, Balachandran uh, episode, uh, when I say episode, it's a, a tragedy. Um, what uh, we've done with that footage is the original video footage um, and the original stills, we had them analyzed extensively by a, uh, a, 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 a top uh, world leading company who do this kind of forensic analysis of images, digital images. They do it for courts, they do it for the British police, they're a very, very respected organization. Um, and they said that, that there was no fakery, that they could, there was no, they analyzed them frame by frame, they analyzed them uh, uh, to the nth degree and established that these were for real. Um, 
we also had a forensic pathologist look at the nature of the wounds and describe exactly what had happened to work out what had happened to work out to look at things like on for example the execution footage where we see people being executed to look at the way the blood spatter the the, the way that the injuries form the way the bodies fall uh, and both of them entirely independently said there is no doubt that this footage uh, is genuine uh, we know that the UN got an entirely separate team of people to do exactly the same process and they established that they were genuine as well so there is no doubt that this footage is real and the trouble is that the Sri Lankan government has to stop uh, just making these bland denials because uh, they're, 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 they are completely implausible and completely incredible and they have to engage they can't go on denying it the problem is that because they've denied them so emphatically, they can't now change their minds, I suppose, uh, and admit that, the, that these did go on. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is, I mean, uh, I, there is a precedent for them changing their mind because, of course, on the last day of the war, they insisted categorically that no civilians had died. Now they're admitting, oh, well, perhaps there were 8,000 or 7,000 who died. Um, Although, of course, they're saying that wasn't us, it was the LTT or, the, or Crossfire. Now, the LTT are, are certainly guilty of war crimes, there's no doubt about that. But the government can't go on hiding behind the crimes of the LTTE. Last time when the Sri Lankan killing fields was aired, you know, across the world, it saw Sri Lankan army, you know, countering that film with its own documentary, Lies Agreed Upon. So, have you seen it? What does it say? Um, I, 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 I think the title was quite appropriate. Um, uh, it was uh, it was uh, an extraordinary. I mean, it, it, the problem is that that it actually it was actually what they accused us us of being. It was dissembling, dishonest, uh, uh, full of misrepresentations. I mean, you just need to look at um, their most. Uh, um, the, the problem I, the problem underlying it is that the Sri Lankan government doesn't engage sensibly the Sri Lankan regime of, of President Rajapaksa, and I distinguish the regime of President Rajapaksa. Um, from the nation of Sri Lanka. Um, they are two different things and they should not be mixed up. Um, but um, the, the, uh, uh, the Sri Lankan government simply lie. That is the problem and I, I say that quite categorically. I say that as a, as a journalist who works with lawyers all the time. I don't say that lightly. Um, we know that they claimed categorically throughout the war that not a single person had been killed. It was a preposterous lie. Um, if, if the subject wasn't so awful it would be laughable. Um, and I'm afraid that is the tactic that goes on. So in that particular film, um, one of the most grotesque sequences was where they interview the doctors, um, the, the uh, government doctors who had so bravely um, stayed in the, in the, in the, in the war zone, uh, so bravely tried to save lives and made terrible decisions about saving people, who they could save, who they couldn't save had to carry out awful operations on people with, with, with just local anaesthetic, with no general anaesthetic. Um, these very, very brave men, who, if the Sri Lankan government, who kept calling them hostages, um, uh, was genuine, would then have fated them and celebrated them and put them up in good hotels once they'd rescued them. What did they do with them? They put them in jail. They held them by the Criminal Investigation Department. They were held there for two or three months. Then they were paraded at a press conference where they all dutifully said, I'm sorry, we weren't telling the truth, we were frosted by the Tigers, but we're telling the truth now. And then they were taken back into custody. This was shown in that film, the lines agreed upon, with no mention of the fact that these were prisoners, that these men were being paraded at a government arranged press conference, mm -hmm. that there were planted questions from um, sympathetic, uh, government sympathetic journalists, and then they were taken back into custody. Now, um, they are now uh, free, but they can't speak out because such is the regime of terror in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, um, but we know from eyewitness reports what would happen. We know that they were threatened with years and they were threatened with uh, um, uh, being detained and then threatened um, uh, under prevention terrorism and emergency powers acts and then they were going to be held, uh, they would have been charged and they would have been held for years. So they were, they were blackmailed, they were forced to do that. Mm -hmm. This film showed, uh, you know, uh, without making any such explanation, that film I'm afraid, all the adjectives they applied to our film, which was accurate, careful, researched and honest, um, applies very truthfully to this. Yesterday, when the pictures went air, when the when this video was you know aired by various news channels, it created a massive outrage, particularly in the southern India, Tamil Nadu. And the usual army, Sri Lankan army response was that such allegations tend to surface around when United Nations Human Rights Council meetings, you know, take place or die down, you know, afterwards. So how would one, you know, see it? Uh, well, it's it's interesting. Um, 
of course they surface around this time. That's because this is an issue in the news. Um, uh, we are making a film, and we want our film to come to the attention of the world to, to describe what happened. Um, as it happens, actually, um, you know, the, 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 the last film that came out just before the Human Rights came out was a complete coincidence. But this one, it's not a coincidence. Of course, um, I mean, we've made this film, we put it together, and we were very anxious to get it finished in time, um, which we have done um, for the Human Rights Council, because it's very important that this information is available to the missions who are going to be voting on this. Um, we don't apologize for that. Um, it, it, we regard it as journalists as, as something that it's very important we do, that we make this information available to the people who are going to take decisions. They take the decision, we make the information available. That's our job. Um, uh, I don't apologize for that. And do you see the world divided over the issue? You know, a lot of countries, you know, backing the resolution in UN, for example, against Sri Lanka last time. And this time around, too, you know, US is sponsoring a resolution against Sri Lankan government. And, uh, you know, what do you expect from India, from the neighboring countries like India and other countries? Well, I mean, uh, I think the key thing about this resolution and the key thing about what the UN should do um, in a sense, stems from what is the international responsibility. There's, there's two aspects to this. I'll, I'll deal first of all with why India, I think, has to confront this issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the world, uh, uh, in 2005, the United Nations unanimously passed a resolution which endorsed what they called the responsibility to protect. Now, that responsibility to protect very specifically said that, and it was it passed unanimously by every nation in the United Nations, including uh, um, India and, and Sri Lanka, and it said that if a, if a people are being um, are suffering from war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide or um, uh, ethnic cleansing, that the state, first of all, where that is happening, has a duty to protect them. If that state fails to protect them, or indeed in the case of Sri Lanka is actually carrying out those crimes, um, then it said unanimously the UN agreed that they had a duty to intervene to prevent that happening. Now that was passed in 2005. In 2009 they failed to intervene, the international community failed to intervene. Um, but the process which started with that war is still going on. There is still repression in the north. There is still people disappearing, uh, government critics disappearing. There is still very specific um, a denial of rights to the Tamils. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there are still thousands homeless, people are still dying, uh, people are still disappearing, people are still being held prisoner. Um, the UN now has a duty to carry that out, and it's a universally agreed thing. Now, the problem for India, of course, is that India, it's particularly important because India is the nearest neighbor, and India has, I think, in my view, to take the leadership on this because it is the most important country in the whole story. And now I'm just looking around, this, this is just like dead bodies everywhere, burnings, shell bombs, and it just looked very dead, dead and dark everywhere.